from you. Um, this is this is a great uh, venue. We, you are presently virtually in Geneva at the Graduate Institute. You are also with CEPR and you are with the IMF. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful collaboration and it is one that is not new. Um, I want to mention that the that the, this collaboration between the Graduate Institute, the IMF and CEPR um, has long roots. The Graduate Institute has long been a place where people go that want to go to the IMF. The IMF has a long um, link to the Graduate Institute and so does CEPR. Uh, at least two presidents of CEPR have been based at the Graduate Institute. That includes uh, Richard and myself. And therefore, it is a really good venue, even though virtually, to be hosting this presentation of the fiscal monitor that, that was published only last week. And it is one of the venues where we can discuss its implications, because definitely the fiscal monitor of the IMF is one of its flagship publications. Rightly so, but even more so in these days where questions of fiscal deficits, of uh, support for economies through fiscal means, but also of debt are coming to the very forefront of people's worries and questions. In other words, this is what we will be discussing, um, and this is what the fiscal monitor is, uh, is about. More, uh, more precisely, it's going to be about how to spend it well. How much can we foster public investment in this phase of the post or middle of the pandemic when we have to start planning for that? And I dare also say we have to uh, worry about the questions of debt. We have two excellent speakers. First of all, Rafael Espinosa, who is going to, who is one of the authors of the Fiscal Monitor and is going to be presenting the chapter. And afterwards, we have Giancarlo Cosetti from Cambridge, who is going to discuss it. Uh, we will take about half an hour for both the presentation and the discussion, and then leave ample time for you to ask questions. Please uh, use the Q&A uh, button to ask your questions in written. And if you see a question that you like and that you would like to upvote, namely, it's also your question, then you have this possibility to upvote uh, a question and it will get asked with priority. So without further ado, let me hand over to Raphael and uh, for the presentation of this chapter of the Fiscal Monitor from 2000, on October 2020. Floor is yours, Raphael. Thank you very much, Walter, uh, for the introduction. Let me share uh, my, uh, my PowerPoint. Uh, oops. Can you see it well? Yeah. So um, um, what I'm going to present today is, is the work of a team of economists from the uh, Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF. We publish twice a year the Fiscal Monitor, which is a flagship report on fiscal issues. And the theme of this report for uh, uh, this uh, October 2020 uh, issue is, is fiscal policies for the recovery. And these have been done with, with the whole team. Um, so let me start by giving some context to, to the report. The COVID crisis is often divided into three phases. The, the Great Lockdown was a name given to the spring period in which a big part of the world economic activity was suspended. 93% of the world's workers resided in countries with some form of workplace restrictions. Worldwide, uh, work hours fell by 14%, which is equivalent to around 400 million full-time jobs. The immediate approach to policy in that phase was to save lives and, and livelihood. This was the right approach. The priority was to support the health sector and ensure some minimum incomes for workers that were furloughed or dismissed. The second phase of the crisis is when countries start gradually reopening. Um, but this is a phase with acute uncertainty. First, there is always a risk of falling back 
with uh, additional restrictions when the virus gets out of control. Uh, this is why policies should focus on creating the conditions for safe returning to work. And then also containment policies should be uh, less blunt than they were in the first wave. In addition, it's very unclear in such a phase what kind of economic activity will be sustainable in the medium term. And that raises questions about the best design of policy. Policies have to be smart, flexible, and robust to uncertainty. One day, hopefully, we'll uh, reach uh, phase three sooner than later. And in that phase, uh, that's the name given to the phase where, where the pandemic will be under control. Governments will have to manage the legacies of the crisis. And these are quite daunting. There will be much higher debt, public debt levels, uh, probably rising inequality, rising poverty, and possibly a lower growth potential. At the same time, governments will have to prepare economies for the future and the future risks that we'll be facing. This leads us to focus on, on public investment. Uh, that's a very interesting focus for the crisis, but let me explain why. Uh, indeed, at the IMF, we often advocate for public investment, but is there something new about this crisis that warrants uh, focusing it now? First, responding to the health crisis, has created immediate needs in the healthcare sector, but also in digital infrastructure, in environmental protection. Uh, for example, the right-hand side chart shows how spending on health, which is a yellow line, declined in percent of GDP in the OECD uh, after the global financial crisis. But this is true for others, other areas of public investment. Second, the macroeconomic conditions are, are really ripe for more investment. Um, this uh, right-hand side chart shows how savings at the uh, aggregate level have shoot up and are, plan and are planned to stay high in the, in the next couple of years. Uh, this is worsening a savings glut that predates the crisis. It's quite possible that precautionary savings will remain high and that private investment will be low. This would depress uh, inflation and interest rates. And this is a kind of environment that calls for public investment financed by borrowing, or at least for the countries, uh, especially the advanced and emerging market countries that do have fiscal space and where the borrowing costs are not too sensitive to borrowing. Public investment is also a type of fiscal stimulus that protects uh, fiscal space. First, it is temporary because the projects have a date when they are finished. And second, uh, it's also a an, an type of investment that uh, type of spending that create future taxable returns. And indeed the previous research done uh, for a different uh, uh, issue of the fiscal monitor had found that assets uh, owned by governments are actually taken into account by markets when they price sovereign risk. Um, so these are positive features of, of this kind of spending. We note in the right-hand side chart that the stock of public capital has unfortunately declined over the last two decades, uh, with maybe the exception of, uh, of China. Finally, the crisis has shown the lack of resilience to, uh, to shocks of our economies. More investments are needed to strengthen resilience and to build a sustainable and inclusive economy. This is a very broad uh, topic, of course. One area that we think is quite important is uh, climate change. And uh, the right-hand side chart here shows uh, the latest assessment by IMF staff of the needs in, uh, of, for investment in uh, adaptation to climate change, which we cost at around 1% of global GDP. Um, I, I will come back to this towards the end of the presentation. So for public investment to be a good instrument for a fiscal stimulus, the crisis we are, we are living through, we have to answer at least four questions. First, can the increase in investment be timely? Past experience, especially from the global financial crisis, had found that it was difficult to scale up public investment quickly uh, during a downturn. So we'll have to think about that. The second question is, would investment create jobs in the current circumstances, because that's what we're looking for, stimulating the economy, creating jobs. 
The third question is, how do we maintain the quality of projects if we are going to scale up investment relatively quickly? And finally, where should we invest in? What should we invest in? Let's start with the first question. We explain in the report how investment can be kickstarted. These are operational issues from a public financial management point of view. They are important to address though, again, because of our past experiences with that. Um, we have highlighted four steps that governments should take to use public investment for a fiscal stimulus. The first step is to invest right now in maintenance. Maintenance spending can actually be scaled up quite quickly. The projects are simple and infrastructure usage is relatively low these days as many people are li living and working differently, working from home, for instance. Maintenance spending is typically below 1% of GDP in OECD countries, and we know they are needed in many areas. To give an example, in the US, it's estimated that there is a backlog of 3.5% of GDP uh, in maintenance of highways and bridges. But there are other examples like that. Um, second, governments should review and restart existing projects, those that were delayed um, by the crisis. This is quite a typical situation, especially in developing countries, that crises lead to a fall in public investment. We looked actually at monthly execution numbers between March and now, and found that about half of emerging markets and low-income developing countries have cut public investment. On average, there is a, an increase by 2%, and on average for advanced economies, public uh, investment has been maintained, but there is a good group of countries for which it has been cut. As a result, when we look at the uh, recent IMF country desk projections for public investment, we find that for around 72 developing countries, public investment would be around 1% of GDP lower than it was for last year. And in most cases, not because of operational issues or implementation issues with the, with the pandemic, it's simply because countries are trying to save money. Um, but this is not really the best, uh, the best way to save money because it's, it creates problems for the future. So the delays could be reversed if financing of investment projects was given a higher priority. A third step to look at is to check the pipelines of projects and select some simple projects that could be implemented quickly, maybe within the next two years. Unfortunately, we have estimated that more than half of governments do not maintain a pipeline of appraised projects from which they can pick up the projects most likely to be implemented quickly. So creating one is really a priority um, and that could be really useful in this crisis. Some fast tracking of projects is also possible with expedited procedures, maybe temporary exemptions. This has been done, for instance, in Australia. Finally, governments should start planning now for new priorities. It can take five to 10 years to complete a complex project. So there is no time to lose. However, that doesn't mean that uh, cutting corners is okay. In a recent book on infrastructure governance, my uh, colleagues at the IMF in the Fiscal Affairs Department have found that over one third of the resources put in creating and maintaining public infrastructure uh, are lost due to inefficiencies. Particular projects often end up costing more than was planned, and is especially true for very complex projects or when investment is being scaled up. In this situation, administrative and economic resources are often stretched. Uh, so what we did in this report to try to provide more evidence and more granularity of this common finding in the literature that there are what is called absorptive capacity constraints with uh, scaling up investment. We analyzed 2,200 World Bank project documents, uh, doing some text mining on these project documents. And they have the advantage uh, that they cover a wide range of countries and a fairly long period. So it's possible to cross this information with information on microeconomic uh, conditions, for instance, and find some relationship between project level outcomes and microeconomic conditions. So again, I, we look at, at granular uh, information on, on the success of uh, projects. Uh, especially we look at cost overruns and time delays. And what we found that uh, as shown in the right-hand side chart, uh, 
is that absorptive capacity constraints can indeed lead to cost overruns of around 10% when public investment is scaled up by let's say 3% of GDP. Um, fortunately, there are ways to mitigate this, uh, this extra cost, especially there is some correlation with strong administration capacity and better planning. Uh, they, these seem to mitigate uh, these problems. Um, and maybe the next chart help help with that. We, we did a similar exercise looking at time delays and we found a range of variables that uh, help explain time delays. To give an example, um, we find that um, countries with uh, projects with rates of return computed at appraisal, which are probably the type of projects that are better assessed, uh, end up with smaller uh, time delays. Um, we also find that projects that have a high share of grant financing, which may uh, proxy for less local ownership, these projects would tend to have longer delays uh, quantitatively for a three-year project um, when the share of uh, grant financing is, uh, is very high, you can end up with five-month delay. So here, these were some conditions to make projects uh, more successful, being on cost and, and on time. Uh, what we want to look next is, if we are doing that, how many jobs can we hope to create? Um, so what we did here was to look at construction uh, firms' data. Um, and using uh, Orbis and CompuStat, we can cover a wide range of, uh, of emerging economies and advanced uh, economies. Um, and we find data for 5,600 construction firms with fairly detailed classification codes, such as construction of utility projects for electricity or construction for highways, streets, and bridges. And this information, when we look at uh, the income statement and the employment data, helps us to quantify um, how much jobs could be directly created by spending on traditional infrastructure. And this is what is shown in, in the right-hand side chart, where uh, what we find is that for this traditional infrastructure, $1 million spent could create between two and three jobs in advanced economies, and maybe five to eight jobs in emerging markets. We can compare that to findings in the literature on the job content of green investment, which is a big topic right now. Um, because of course, as I was mentioning earlier, we also have to think about future crisis. And green investment is a way to uh, mitigate the risk and the cost of future crisis. And um, this literature has suggested that job content of investment, of green investment, could be around eight jobs per million dollar invested. And that is even netting out the job losses in, in traditional investment for which the green investment would substitute. We also uh, looked at the job content of R&D spending, because that's an important part of, uh, of public investment, especially uh, now that we're doing a lot of R&D spending on healthcare. And we find some job content of around five to 10 jobs by, uh, by million dollars spent. So applying these numbers at the global level, 1% uh, of GDP of public investment uh, spent in advanced and emerging markets would create $7 million, $7 million jobs directly. And this excludes the indirect effects, which are the effects of suppliers, because we don't have the data on suppliers here when they provide intermediate inputs, and also all the Keynesian uh, macroeconomic effects. So to look at that, we have to go back to the literature on Keynesian multipliers, look at the overall effect. Um, the problem is that this crisis is quite different. So we have highlighted in the report four reasons why we think this crisis is different. And, and we have to keep in mind these differences before uh, trying to quantify the size of the fiscal multiplier. Um, we have to be careful in using historical precedent, basically. Um, the first factor is global debt is at historic heights. Um, it's expected to jump to around 100% of GDP for public debt at the global level. And there are some good theoretical reasons to worry about how debt could affect the multiplier. We developed a, a sovereign debt distress model, the tradition of uh, Eton and Gersowitz, where um, the likelihood of a government defaulting its debt depends on the costs and benefits of, uh, of defaulting. And uh, we added public investment to that model 
where public investment allows us to get higher growth in the future and therefore higher taxable uh, income. And, uh, and the model showed that fiscal multipliers can actually fall quite abruptly if investment spending leads to excessive borrowing and uh, high risk premia. This is captured by the red dot on the right hand side chart, where basically to simplify for uh, some emerging markets and for frontier leaks that have already high levels of debt, there is a risk that more borrowing could uh, shoot up uh, spreads, let's say by 350 basis points to give an example, in which case a fiscal multiplier would collapse to only about 0 0.1. There is indeed an empirical literature that has also documented this, um, which I mentioned here in the reference. Second, we look at other factors, uh, which is uh, specific of this crisis, especially the lockdown period, which is that there are supply constraints. And we know from the theoretical work by Guerrieri and others that this can reduce multipliers. A third characteristic of the crisis is um, that there is a lot of uncertainty right now in the economy. This is captured by the right-hand side chart here that shows a disagreement again among professional forecasters on the growth rate for next year in the US and the EU area. And you see that um, with uh, this uh, measure indexed at uh, 100 for 2000, for 2000, how during the GFC, this uncertainty triplicated, but in the COVID crisis, it, it was multiplied by eight or nine. Now it's come down, but we're still at a level of uncertainty that are as high or slightly higher than during the peak of the GFC. So this means that um, um, the macro context is so uncertain, it's not clear what would be the consequence for the fiscal multiplier. It could go either way, and, and we'll, we'll do some, uh, some work in the next slides on that. The fourth characteristic is that the private sector balance sheets are going to come out very badly affected by the crisis. And that could also weaken the response of the private sector to public spending. So we looked at these two questions in the report specifically. For the first question, we'll, we did a traditional macro exercise. Um, we estimate the fiscal multiplier of public investment, but conditioning it uh, on the level of uncertainty uh, as proxied again by the disagreement between professional forecasters on, on growth next year. The analysis is based on a large panel and the shocks to public investment are identified using deviation from IMF uh, desk forecast as was done for instance by Arbach and Gornichenko. We use nonlinear projections and found that the multiplier can be above two in periods of high uncertainty. This is a blue bar uh, comparing, the, you can compare the, the period of high uncertainty with the baseline multiplier. Um, the same model was, uh, was applied to uh, estimate the impact on private investment and on employment. And, uh, and the yellow bar is what we used to come up with the estimate that 1% of global uh, uh, GDP of investment would create around 20 to 33 million jobs. Um, so this, this was not actually the prior we had that uncertainty would strengthen the fiscal multiplier. But actually there is some literature on that that predates us, uh, especially done in the US, some, some work by uh, Rudiger Bachmann and, and Eric Sims. And uh, the key thing here is to realize that, especially when the private sector is really worried and it, all of its investment and hiring plans are frozen, Public spending can really uh, um, can really help uh, anchor expectations on on growth. So we found that uh, this shock to public investment increased the mean forecast of the private sector for growth for next year, and also reduced uh, private sector uncertainty on uh, future growth, which is the right hand side chart here. Um, so. Our first main result was that the multiplier could be quite strong. However, as we said, we worried a little bit about the weakness of corporate balance sheets. And so we checked um, whether the multiplier could be lower because of that. There is some good theoretical reasons for that. Um, so we want to check it on the data. Uh, what we did was to use a large uh, data set of about 400,000 firms covering 26 advanced economies and 23 emerging markets over uh, I think 25 to 30 years. Um, and did the same kind of uh, uh, shock uh, identification procedure as in the previous uh, model. And we found um, a fairly strong difference between firms 
that have strong balance sheets versus firms that have weak balance sheets. In the right-hand side chart, we distinguish between firms with high leverage and firms with high, low leverage. And we find that firms with low leverage pretty much do not increase their investment uh, when there is a shock to public investment. So in a sense, the crowding in of, uh, of private investment by public investment is close to zero or even slightly negative. Um, so that means that it's really important to address um, the leverage of firms. And the same is true for cash constraints. I'm not presenting it, but we also have similar results for uh, liquidity constraints of firms that also weakens the, the response of firms to, uh, to public spending. And actually several advanced economies have realized the importance of supporting firms, of course. Uh, let me take advantage of this presentation to, uh, to mention the work that my colleagues have done on the chapter one of the fiscal monitor, where they looked at the composition of, uh, of support measures. And uh, a really big part of support measures to the private sector was in the form of, the form of liquidity support for firms. Uh, so this is really a, a good policy that is complementary to more traditional fiscal stimulus. So given that uh, we can hope there are this condition of uh, complementarity measures, fairly good multipliers for public investment, uh, where should we invest in? Um, so increasing spending on treatments for COVID-19 uh, for vaccine re research and delivery is essential. Delivering vaccines would cost around $25 billion globally, according to the Gates Foundation. But there are also needs in other areas, such as social housing, making buildings and transportation safe, um, and uh, infrastructure for uh, digital connectivity, for instance. Um, so looking first at the health system, uh, we looked at the costs of that, and we didn't find that the costs were very large. Uh, for instance, the right-hand side charts show the association between pandemic preparedness to fight uh, COVID-19 and uh, to close the gap between Georgia and Denmark, which is about 10 points in the WHO index of pandemic preparedness, you would only need about 0.02% uh, of GDP uh, of spending on medical products such as uh, um, masks, uh, protective equipment, uh, syringes, um, approaches for x-ray for the lungs. This kind of spending is actually not that high. Um, to strengthen the overall health system, it, the correlation is about, uh, is stronger, which means that you would find uh, maybe you need to spend about 0.2% of GDP per year to close the gap uh, between, let's say, Georgia and Denmark, which is 10 points in this index. Um, but the pandemic is not the only crisis ongoing and that, that can affect us in the next few years. Um, we also looked at climate change risks. Um, we focused on, on that chapter on uh, uh, investment for climate change adaptation because there is a whole uh, chapter of the World Economic Outlook looking at investment for climate change mitigation. And what we did, uh, as I mentioned at the, in the introduction was to quantify the uh, spending needs around the world. We found about 1% of GDP globally. Let me focus here specifically on the poorest countries. And um, we found for the poorest countries, uh, there need to be about uh, $25 billion of, uh, of needs in investment uh, in climate change adaptation, which is about $15 billion more per year than what is currently uh, uh, um, given and uh, lent by, uh, by official aid um, for the poorest 50 countries. So it's a fairly significant increase that, that is needed more than, more than twice, but it's something that is affordable for the international community. Um, investment for uh, climate change adaptation is already given to the right countries. What we found was a good correlation between the needs which are uh, on the vertical axis here and the eight flows that uh, come from the OECD data. So the allocation is not bad, but the, but the scale has to be increased. And we think this would be a really good use of public money because the rates of returns for this kind of investment often exceed 100% and can even exceed 1,000% in, in areas such as flood protection. So let me conclude with a summary table that tries to capture in a concrete way the actions, the key actions that governments can take 
to uh, make use of public investment as an instrument for stimulating the recovery. I'm going to focus on, uh, on phase one and phase two first, in, uh, that's the red box. You will recall we started the presentation by recommending spending on maintenance and projects that are already active for phase one. Um, we also recommended uh, for phase two to focus on uh, job-rich projects that can have large fiscal multipliers especially zoo that are already ongoing and that have been delayed because of uh, financing constraints. Often these financing constraints uh, slow down public investment and that's really not a good outcome. We need investment projects to be uh, uh, pr brought to, to, front, to, to a completion to have them get the, the, the highest uh, payoff. Finally, the crisis has highlighted the lack of resilience of our economies. So we need more investment in areas such as healthcare, digital infrastructure, and also to prepare ourselves to climate change. Uh, complex projects especially take uh, up to five to 10 years to, to be implemented. So governments should really start working on those now. So thanks a lot for uh, listening and I look forward to our discussion. I'm going to pause my- uh... Thank you very much, Raphael. I hand the floor immediately over to our discussant, Giancarlo Cosetti, the floor is yours. Thank you, Beatrice. So thank you for inviting me to this, um, to discuss this chapter of the fiscal monitor. Uh, it is actually useful reading. I enjoy the reading and uh, I found uh, uh, the, 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 this issue of fiscal monitor particularly nice. Uh, let me see if I can scroll. You see my screen, right? Perfect. So uh, the message is clear, a time to reactivate public investment as a key policy tool. And the argument with all the, you know, uh, sort of caveats at the end of the day is that uh, we can expect reasonably high multipliers, employment effects. We can expect lasting effects on output that uh, sort of preserve fiscal space. And it's also the opportunity to pursue some long-term goals like uh, you know the sustainable, sustainable development goal, green economy, or anything to prepare for the next crisis. And the chapter is also trying to produce a, a constructive framework, uh, useful uh, constructive framework. So the idea is that you want to scale up investment by looking at uh, anything which has to do with maintenance, uh, reactivate existing projects, and then plan ahead new projects uh, by the way, it also, it also makes a point, the chapter, that maybe we should think of maintenance uh, ahead. And that means that in your, cost, in your projected cost, the cost of project will be higher. You need to sort of put down also the need for maintenance. So the chapter goes on on uh, content quality, doing more with less efficiency, and review of open issues in, uh, in public investment. So in my comment, I basically draw on uh, uh, you know, experience, what uh, we, we've been working on in uh, Cambridge and other places for uh, monitoring fiscal institutions to uh, discuss some open issues in the, in the paper. So but anything I say, you know, it's supposed to be a complement of what you find there. So let me start uh, to reiterate the public investment was actually very low before the COVID crisis. And uh, Public investment is tricky because you need a divine coincidence for public investment. And the divine coincidence is that you need to have political consensus on what you want to spend on. And here you have political cycles of shifting opinions. So today, the good thing is that there is enough political consensus also before COVID on repairing the crumbling infrastructure, updated infrastructure, the green economy, digitalization, maybe education, surprisingly not aging. I mean. Is really aging not requiring more public investment? This is something that we could think about. Also related to, to of course, health. Then uh, feasible plans. You need to have plans on, on the table that are uh, on the optimal scale, fit, uh, uh, what you can do at the time. It's not always the case. And last one, right governance at all levels, right? Central, regional. I always in mind the, the German plan to invest in schooling infrastructure, a great initiative by the federal government that was basically blocked by landers on uh, you know, concern of, of, of interference 
right? So you run, Republic invents, you run always into this. At the end of, you know, in the last mile, you have somebody blocking the investment. So uh, the COVID-19 brings in a, an additional challenge. You need to scale up. And that means that you go more than ever against scarcity of managerial ability, skills, capacity, control capacity. You may have supply constraints. So is this time, uh, can, can we get away with it? Is this time special, uh, different? Now, I, I'm taking a slightly more optimistic view than Raphael, contrary to my mood, to my, to my personality. Let me be a little bit optimistic, saying that uh, we still have uh, large unemployed resources. We still can think of counting and engineering a period of low borrowing cost and accommodative monetary policy. So it is important that we have a monetary and fiscal policy together, avoiding the risk of premature tightening and exploiting the complementarity between monetary and fiscal policy in creating space, policy space for each other. Incidentally, in Geneva, we just had the early presentation of Geneva report is all about that. And let me do some publicity. So on top of that, shock is global. And if uh, the reaction is symmetric, the spillover can be positive as self-reinforcing counteracting leakages. And the third, last point, international institutions at least so far seem keen on giving grants to countries in need. So part of this public investment may come not from uh, you know, borrowing, but from, from grants. This happened even inside the Euro area. Now, um, we can expect large multipliers, net of inefficiency, meaning if you effectively spend one euro, one dollar, you have a large multiplier, but that one dollar may cost more because of many reasons. You can spend a little bit of crowding in. And I would like to call attention to a big problem here. We, apart from the growth rate, we really need to restore the output level. And for fiscal sustainability, we need to sort of come back as soon as possible to the level of output that we had pre-COVID. And this is a point that, you know, with Lorenzo Codogno, we try to convey as much as uh, we could. Now, let me raise three issues in the five minutes that I'm left with. The first one is that if you look at the content of the sausage of public investment, you realize that public investment goes to large firms, okay, with political connection. Now, uh, there is a beautiful paper coming out of uh, a lot of people there, there are not Didia, Ernesto, Rafael, and Mike, Michael, called Big G. And they just look at the content, how, who, who is doing the, the procurement work in the US, and basically it's highly, highly concentrated. Now, this is good news on the one hand, because now we know the granularity is important. So large firms are important for the cycle. So in a way, we, we can have an effect by reactivating large firms. But on the other hand, is concentration. So, and you remember that the state now needs to scale up, basically calling in and face big guys, big guys with, with, with strong ideas. So we may go into an emergency, an emergency situation, which we really need to rethink procurement and redefining how public and private uh, sectors work together. It is a matter of incentives. It is a matter of stakeholders. It is a matter of corporate behavior, but I see this as unavoidable because, you know, let's be frank, there is not much money around. I mean, I know that people think that this is the time to spend, but this does not mean the resources are infinite, quite the opposite. So there is a little, there is a, 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 a you know, an effort to have planning, man management, monetary skills in the public sector up to, up to, you know, standard, climate infiltration is another issue. The other thing is uncertainty. I like the way they, they talk about uncertainty in the paper, in the, sorry, in the, in the chapter. I want to, however, sort of look at uncertainty more, not as a VR impulse response, but as a concrete, you know, mechanism of transmission. So what, pub, what uh, public investment does in a period where I don't know whether I, there is anybody there who wants my stuff, it gives me a cash flow financed by taxpayer or by, you know, ultimately financed by taxpayer. So it sort of reduce my uncertainty about the value of my firm. 
the, 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 my viability, right? And also gives me collateral, the cash flow, this contract is collateral in principle I could use with a bank for credit. Indirectly, it also reassure my workers about the high uncertainty of losing their job and losing their, their, their lifetime or the employment income. And there's a beautiful paper by Pontus Randall on how this works in terms of multiplier. We need more empirical work on this. I try a little bit to look at procurement and the effect of uncertainty on cash flow and, and credit. It's difficult because, you know, at times of uh, normal times, it may not be there, that could be crowding out. And there are a lot of endogeneity, but it would be nice to understand how much this cash flow uh, element is there. And also there is a lessons. There are a bunch of lessons for, for governments. If you look at the experience, this cash flow is often a political or, or a policy uh, instrument. Governments delay payment for budget reason. They, they system, in some countries systematically pay late and unpredictably. This creates a bad equilibrium. No, where basically firms endogenously ex ante start to increase, increase cost and prices, delay delivery, augment cost. All this at time of COVID is a little bit of an issue because no, there is also a political sustainability. So again, coming back, how, how do we act on quality of institutions, transparency of information, and maybe social capital, news, uh, you know, uh, people sort of understanding what's going on there. Uh, last bit, I debt, private and public. Let me start with the public. It's interesting because at the IMF with Ander Meyer in 2010, we have basically one of the first paper in which we were sort of pointing out the sovereign and private risk are strongly correlated, not only through banking loops, much, much more general. And this paper is going to the economic journal and you know, the problem with, with having a steep burst of sovereign risk is that sometimes, or with high debt, becomes subject to belief-driven volatility and an anchored expectation. And that means, if you think about it, ex ante means that my cash flow from public procurement may be volatile, may, 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 be, may be interrupted, may be discontinued. And this is actually sometimes you not know, the, the, the norm rather than the exception in public projects. Many public projects are left hanging there. So why all this debate? Because you know, especially in the short run, this is what monetary and fiscal institutions, national, international monetary institutions should really keep an eye on. We need to sort of reduce the vulnerability to this belief-driven uh, uh, crisis. Uh, about corporate debt, it's a very nice study with 40,000 corporates that is presented in the, in the report. Um, and basically showing that the, there is crowding in on investment only if corporate debt is low. Now, this for COVID is a big deal because, you know, we will get out of this period of lockdown and, and spread of the disease with firms substantially more in debt. And maybe there will be more in debt exactly in those sectors which should survive, right? Because if you have a firm that is viable, you would like to resist, but the way you resist is to, to come out with more debt. So that could be actually, you know, if the study of the, of the report is right, it could be a problem in the tr uh, transmission of public investment. Almost done. I want to raise two issues specific to COVID-19, uh, more issues specific to COVID-19. One is the possibility of supply disruption. Now, we, we, in Cambridge, we have been working quite a bit on this, on the input output vulnerability, national and global. Uh, it is a problem. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, it may, it may be, it may interfere with the multiplier, but not too, too strongly, but it's something to, to keep an eye on. But most important is the medium to long run. Uh, you know, in the not unlikely case that COVID will persist, there will be a need for sectoral reallocation and capacity. Now we need to have, you know, we may think of a world where there is more distance, distancing. Now, how do we invest in capacity for more distance? How do we invest in technology that bypass this issue? Uh, it could be a problem, right? Uh, on, or, or could be an issue in uh, deciding which project to do in public investment. And at the time of high uncertainty, it may be very difficult. Uh, productivity is basically at the end what, uh, you know, we need to, to keep an eye on. Uh, but uh, let me uh, join the, 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 the spirit of the report to, to insist uh, 
on the fact that, uh, you know, uh, now we need stimulus. So we need to start spending in new, in new projects. So we need to go for projects that can be started now. And for example, it's a looming issue in the Euro area where well, after a great start, now lots of issues are coming up and it looks like, uh, you know, EU funding may simply replace domestic funding. There is a concrete risk of premature withdrawal of stimulus there, which should be avoided. Uh, and of course, we need to address needs related to the pandemic. Second, contain the, scholars, uh, uh, the cost of scaling up. The multiplier of effective investment will be very large, but if we have a tax on investment because of inefficiency or whatever, uh, you know, the effective multiplier exposed may be very low. And uh, it's not only an institutional sustainability, at this stage it's also political sustainability. We need to work on that. People must, must, be, must be, there must be, you know, some kind of political legitimacy. And uh, at this point also, that sustainability is, is an important uh, issue. We can think about the debt overrun soon, but at, that, at this stage, all the instruments we use should be you know, put in place to avoid the uh, best surprises on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giancarlo. Uh, this was a very, uh, you, you have touched on a lot of topics and, um, Therefore, I think uh, a lot of what you have covered would also have covered some of my questions. I will go, since we only have a bit of time left, uh, to some of the audience questions and try to summarize a few of them. Um, so there are more than one people, persons in the audience that are concerned, and this is for you, Raphael, about uh, the question of political cycles and how they relate to public investment. Uh, you, uh, how, do you, how do you see this in the context uh, now of COVID in particular? But then also the more general questions that relate to what about the legal and governance framework? Is it really there for large scale investment now? And related to that, the question about what about corruption? Have all those concerns that typically cloud some of the public investment um, arguments uh, or effectiveness uh, gone away now, or are they even bigger uh, in the in the context of the pandemic? Thanks. Let me start with the uh, the political cycle. Um, which is also a macroeconomic cycle as well in investment. I mean, both of them leads to kind of boom and bust in, in, uh, in public investment. Something we've highlighted in the report is that often when there are tight financing constraint, it's public investment that takes the hit first. I don't know if that's a political cycle, is that a political choice because of a macro cycle, but it's still something that is kind of harmful because uh, you would really want projects to go to the end to... Uh, to give their long-term yields. And this volatility in public investment, um, which happens uh, in, in, in many countries, but uh, also has been one of the driver of discussions on, uh, on fiscal rules, for instance, whether fiscal rules should protect investment. Otherwise, again, it's going to be the first, the first uh, area of public spending that is cut. I think that's a, that's a very important point. And, and, and the report talks a little bit about that by saying, look, um, we are observing now in the countries that, that are facing financing constraint that public investment is being cut. That's not a good outcome. Um, and uh, you know, some prioritization is fine. And maybe in some countries where you really need the money to save lives, it's fair enough, but uh, you would really want this, uh, these choices to be taking into account the long-term as well, not just a very short run. Um, on the legal and governance framework, I think also something that came back to what uh, Giancarlo was mentioning, which I think is a very important point, that it's not easy to scale up investment uh, because many parties uh, are involved including at the subnational level. Um, that's, uh, I think in many countries, 40, 50, 60% of investment is actually executed by subnationals. And that talks to... Um, finding common grounds uh, across different level of administrations and maybe finding uh, original financing mechanisms for the money to be allocated uh, so that the money is allocated for that purpose. What we, what we highlight in the report is the importance of having relatively simple projects, thing that we can do relatively quickly 
uh, because you know maintenance, everybody agrees on it. It's relatively straightforward, simple to pass through. That that's a kind of, uh, of argument we make. Slightly related, but more on the uh, on the corruption side, is is the issue of uh, of um, of the fact that scaling ups of projects, especially if they're not very transparent and complex, can lead to to more corruption and, and more money lost. Um, what we did in the report was mentioning a bit the uh, the question of uh, of uh, how do you define how do you design the project, how you know well has been done the cost benefit analysis, um, how much local ownership there is, um, has you know is there enough transparency in the choice of projects? These are all fairly important uh, steps to ensure that that these costs are, are minimized. But we do find on average that scaling up leads to more problems. That's been a that's been a, a common finding in the literature. And what we did in the report is to give a bit of granularity by looking at cost of runs. And so we do find this cost of runs of 10, 10 percent. Um, we're not sure if they are just you know uh, inflation driven or if there are other uh, factors, but 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 they are there, uh, and they, they could be linked to corruption in some countries. So these are these are particularly important questions. I I, I agree with. Um, we haven't looked at corruption especially. There was a, a fiscal monitor a couple of years ago looking at at how to contain corruption. And we know that the, the, the costs are really macro significant. So it's, it's a big part of our work at the IMF uh, to, uh, to propose uh, institutional approaches to, uh, to limit the cost of corruption. All right. So maybe a second complex of questions, and I think this one goes to both of you, if I may, uh, relates to the question of debt. Um, the, the proposition here is, and uh, this is not, uh, not only the fiscal monitor, the general view right now is that we have uh, that debt sustainability uh, is uh, different from the past because one of the uh, of the of the key facts going forward seem to be very low interest rates for very long and therefore uh, financing through debt uh, should not be as expensive as it has been in the past. So this is one of the macro conditions uh, underlying uh, higher debt level sustainability. Um, how much trust do you have in this? Is, uh, is this, uh, how much should we worry? In the fiscal monitor presentation, Vitor Gaspar last week said that is not our primary concern right now. That was a very stark message. Um, can you comment again? You know, maybe I'll start with Giancarlo. Um, so first, for many countries, the global interest rate may be very uh, low, but uh, there could be a hike in uh, risk premium. So the borrowing cost for countries may be high. This is actually true also for large, uh, you know, the Euro area, the crisis in the Euro area in the 2010-12, when count counting. Uh, uh, we didn't see that in the UK or the US, but it's possible. So uh, what I'm saying is the fact that uh, the low borrowing cost uh, is, is not uh, a given and uh, it comes out of good politics. So <laughs> policies, or good politics and policies, of course. So that is not our priority, but it, 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 it cannot be taken for granted. And, and that is actually at the crux of uh, this kind of emergency response today with an idea that at some point uh, the big response must be unraveled somehow and brought back to a new regime, a new normal. So this is my first uh, response. The second response is that uh, down the line that will turn into debt overhang. I mean, like uh, we, we, we can, you know, we can decline debt overhang in different ways for like poor countries, emerging market, but it will be everywhere. And at some point uh, we'll have to think about how to avoid the uh, lost decades coming, right? Because of this unresolved uh, that thing. But for the time being, I think we need to work to delay, I would say, you know, to delay the, 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 the problem of that, making sure that in the short run stimulus is sustainable. And that there is like an exit there that, you know, at some point will, will be reasonably manageable. Rafael. It's a very, very, you know, 
wishful thinking answer, <laughs> but it is it is what it is at this point. I, I think Vitor, Vitor is right that, that that is not at this point the priority, as long as we, we have instruments to play like that. <laughs> no, well, I don't expect you to say Vitor is wrong. <laughs> so is your boss, but... <laughs> never there. Some of my colleagues, I think, said something along the lines, you have to win the war before you worry about how you're going to pay for it. So I think for the countries for which you have, um, you don't have a risk that uh, spreads, which shoot up quickly. Uh, for these countries where you don't have that worry, I think it is a time to, to worry about how to win the war and how to, how to get out uh, with a stronger economy in the future. Um, Giancarlo was mentioning, we have to go back to the same level of GDP we used to have uh, before, and that's you know, to the same trend, and not just the growth rates. And that requires uh, you know, some some strong uh, responses to limit the damage because high unemployment, misallocated capital, all of this could be really problematic for the long run level of the of, of GDP and therefore for fiscal sustainability itself. Um, so you, don't, you, you so that's the first thing. But 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 we do say in the report very clearly you have to distinguish those countries uh, that have that uh, access to the financing at, at the global low rates from those where where the risk premium could shoot up. And uh, something that uh, the fiscal affairs department of the IMF has, has mentioned before is that we can't take the low rates for, grant, for granted. Um, risk premium shoot up too late, but you know, but they, they can shoot up quickly when, when fiscal tensions arrive. So uh, there is important work done by some of my colleagues showing that um, sovereign rates do shoot up before fiscal crisis. And, uh, and there is also work that say that the debt ratio, the debt to GDP ratio is the most uh, important variable in empirical estimates of uh, the likelihood of fiscal crisis. Uh, so we can't completely abstract from, from the debt and from the stock of liabilities, independently of what the cost of funding is, there is a variable to keep a close eye on. Um, so, so all this to say that uh, for, for quite a few countries, and we know which one we're talking about, you know, the ones who have their own reserve currency, we have a very strong central bank that, uh, that support low rates, where the exchange rate is credible, etc. All of these have, have quite a lot of space. For those where that's not the case, they have to be careful of their of their uh, deficit uh, path going forward. And sorry, if I just may add, the, the level of output is very important. I forgot to mention. Like in public investment may actually be a good choice at this point if we think that it will have a lasting effect, a lasting effect on our economy. That's end of football. Okay. The difference with consumption. That maybe one last point where we should have time for one short quest, uh, short uh, answer, if possible, Rafaela. Green, the green investment you mentioned, uh, the needs to to invest uh, to green the planet. And um, uh, Charles Wiplosch is saying, uh, well, this should be mo mostly public investment. Uh, there is, however, also a component of who. Uh, obviously, it's a public good, but it's sometimes not a local or regional. It's actually a global public good. So, who should be paying for it uh, is also a question. Do you have any views on that? So, to, to answer for the first question, yes, it is public investment. In fact, the numbers we report in the report are, are specifically for for the public investment needs. Um, and uh, you know, at the national level, let's say for for the part that that uh, when we're looking at uh, climate change adaptation. Look at climate change adaptation. The rates of returns are local um, because it is about protecting your cities against floods, etc. And you know, I would say that most of the expenses uh, can legitimately be borne by the national governments in the sense that if they have the financing capacity, they are the ones who are going to ripe the, the returns on that. Uh, and the returns are very high, so they should do it. Um, we do highlight in the report that there are quite a few countries, and we, we focus on the 50, 50 most fragile countries. For which obviously they don't have uh, this this uh, this uh, financing capacity, and uh, and international aid will be really necessary for them. Now I don't really have a, uh, an answer on the uh, climate change uh, mitigation, which is I think what maybe Charles was more thinking about. That uh, climate change mitigation is is a global public good, and uh, and I think that's uh, uh, that's something I would not want to go into too much because I have not studied that question. All right. One, uh, Do you have anything that you want to add, Giancarlo? No, just, just one uh, minute. One, one of the privileges of being in Cambridge is that many students work for the IMF during the summer, so and, and they come to me and we discuss and they, you know we we, we have uh, I, I mean in that input. One thing I learned is that uh, this green investment is producing study of green investments are producing very large multiplier. 
so large that I think it, 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 we, we are looking at them with a little bit of suspicion. But uh, it is, uh, uh, again, it is something that we need to learn how much of this capital may go you know, uh, into uh, you know, persistent uh, effect on employment and output. Uh, so uh, this is just like to, to reiterate what uh, Rafael was saying. It could be a, a good way to go. We have not been able to address all the questions. We have a very active uh, audience and uh, some some questions uh, will we will forward them uh, to uh, Rafael uh, so he can maybe he, he may be able to address some of them offline. We thank uh, very much Rafael and Giancarlo for being uh, for doing this today for doing this presentation. I thank the audience for being with us. And uh, now we need to finish on time because in this virtual world everybody has to run to the next virtual meeting. <laughs> See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Giancarlo? <laughs>